Hello, travelers. Welcome to Reach the World's Explore program. For more than 20 years, Reach the World has taken students on virtual exchange journeys around the world. My name is Brianna, and I'm so glad that you're joining us for today's live stream event. Today, we're talking with citizen scientist and educator Maria Ives. Maria has contributed to conservation field work projects around the world. She uses those experiences in the field to inform and inspire her middle school students in New Jersey. Maria is joining us today as part of Reach the World's virtual exchange with extraordinary female members of the Explorers Club. You can read Maria's article about her work and meet more of the women at the forefront of discovery worldwide by visiting at home.reachtheworld.org slash explore. Now, please feel free to use the YouTube chat bar to let us know you're here, where you're joining in from, and of course, to share any questions that you have for Maria as we go. We'll get to as many questions as we can over the next 45 minutes. All right, it's time to embark on a virtual exchange expedition. Maria, welcome to Reach the World. Thank you so much for having me today. It's really an honor. Great. So I think today you have some um, some slides and, to share with us. I do. Great. So if you want to jump right in, we'd love to hear some stories about your field work. All right. Here we go. So I feel like I need to just set the scene a little bit. When I was a young girl, I feel like my early days of exploration really started at my grandparents' home in Vermont. When I was younger, we had the opportunity to go there for vacations and sometimes on weekends. I love to explore the property and lift up rocks and look for salamanders and just travel up and down the stream looking for any signs of wildlife. But as I grew older, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. I started out as an elementary teacher. I taught third grade and third grade teachers teach all subject areas. Science was always my favorite subject to teach. I love teaching my students about volcanoes and we track the migration of monarch butterflies. And one summer I found a job that helped me combine both of those passions, my passion for teaching and for wildlife. So I found a job at the Bronx Zoo in their education program. In this program, we brought students all around the zoo and we taught them about different habitats. And then we got to bring animals to the children in the classroom from each of those habitats. And I absolutely loved working at the zoo and being near those animals. But it started to make me think I really wanted to travel and see animals in their natural habitat. And so while I was working at the zoo, I learned about this conservation biology program at Columbia University, and they were offering um, funding for teachers. So I enrolled. While I was in this program and I had my professors were people from the Wildlife Conservation Society. So I really got to learn about conservation from some of the best scientists in the world. While I was there, I learned about a program called Earthwatch and how Earthwatch partners people up. Their focus is citizen science. And a citizen scientist is someone who gets to help scientists collect data for their projects. And I thought, this is exactly what I've been looking for. So I applied for a fellowship. And the first fellowship that I received with Earthwatch was a Gray Whales of British Columbia project. We spent most of our time looking at the behavior of the whales. So we did this in three different ways. We went out on boats. We did our research from the base camp, which was in an area called Skull Cove. Sounds kind of ominous. And we also did some kayaking. While we were locating the whales, we also helped with photo identification. So we used the special markings on the flank of the whale to see if these were whales that had been in the area or if they were new to the population. This project was in August. You can see I'm all bundled up. It was cold, it was rainy. We slept in tents and my tent was wet. I wore these knee high rubber boots you can see in one of the pictures. I showered once in nine days. <laughs> This sounds horrible for most people, but I absolutely loved it. And when I came home, I started thinking about 
my next opportunity. What can I do next? So I applied for another fellowship. And this fellowship brought me to South Africa to help with a South African elephant project in a national park called Shishlui Umfalosi. In Shishlui, the elephants, or our, the focus of our study was seeing if the elephants population was getting too large for the area. In the early 1900s, most of the animal populations had been wiped out and they started to slowly bring animals back into the park to repopulate it. In the 60s, they brought in rhinos. In the 80s, they brought in some elephants. The elephant population didn't work out too well at first because the elephants were young, they were in something called must, and they actually started killing the white rhinos. So in 2000, they brought another elephant population into the park. My project was in 2003. So we were again helping to see if the park could hold this brand new population of elephants. The entire citizen science team that I was part of was made up of women. And even the principal investigator, the scientist who created this project was also a woman. And I think it's important for me to point that out. And many of my teams that I've been part of have been predominantly made up of women. So our research was again to see if this park could hold this population of elephants. So we had to see if there was enough food to support all of the herbivores that lived in the park. So we would go out and we had plots and we would measure plants. We would collect data on the different type of plants that were growing in there. We learned to look at the leaves to see what animals had been browsing on those different leaves. So you could tell if it was a white rhino by the angle of the, the chew marks on the leaf. We also look for signs of destruction from the elephants. And so in one picture that I have here, you can see that's an elephant break. There were so many incredible animals in this park. This is my very first time to Africa, my very first time to South Africa. And I saw every single animal that I was hoping to see. There were lions, there were hyenas, I saw a leopard. I even saw a pack of wild dogs one night. It was a dream come true. We had rangers that walked with us in the park when we were doing our research because we were in the same area that all of these wild animals were. But one day we went out to do our research and when we got to the area, there were rhinos on our plot. So we thought, well, how can we collect data if there are rhinos on our plot? So one of the rangers gets out of the vehicle and starts walking towards the rhino. The ranger starts banging on his gun and the rhino starts charging him. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is gonna be terrible. The rhino charged at him, but at the last moment veered off and ran in the opposite direction. That was just one of many heart stopping moments that I had on this expedition. So I think it's important to share how we traveled around in the park. And you can see there's a sign here telling tourists, this is exactly what you shouldn't do. We're riding around in the back of these pickup trucks, but this made it easy for us to hop in and out of the vehicles so that we could grab our equipment and get to our plot area. And for the most part, this was fine. Riding around in the vehicles in the back of this truck here until there was one day we were driving back from completing our research and there were tourists on the road and any tourists could come in. They weren't in safari vehicles. They could just be in there, you know, two door, four door sedan. And there was a herd of elephants. This young elephant got separated from the herd and rightfully so it got very agitated. And so this young elephant, while I was riding in the back of the pickup truck, started charging us. And I just kept taking photos until you can see, this is what happens when you realize you have to stop taking pictures and get down as you're speeding away. And even though this was a young elephant, it was still very frightening to be charged by an elephant. I can not even imagine what it would be like to be charged by a full grown elephant. I learned so many lessons on this expedition. I saw giraffes 
using their long tongues to get around the thorns of the acacia tree to eat the leaves. And I thought, all right, that's incredible that giraffes can do that. And one day when we were walking in the field, I felt a sharp pain. At first I thought maybe I was bitten by a snake because of course that was my first thought. And then I looked down at my shoe and I realized just an acacia thorn had pierced the bottom of my boot. So I guess my boots were no match for the acacia thorns. Another lesson I learned was make sure you zip up your tent because vervet monkeys love to steal. This vervet monkey stole a whole loaf of bread from the kitchen area. I did heed the advice and I didn't have anything stolen from my tent, but this was a great reminder of why. The following summer, I applied for another fellowship. And this time I went to Kenya and I worked on a Samburu Communities of Samburu Communities Wildlife Habitats project. And so we were in Samburu in a town of Wamba. And this is just me looking over an area that I dreamed of seeing, the grasslands of Africa. Now, most of the animals were confined to the local national park, Samburu National Park, but we did get to see this endangered species. It's a grevy zebra. And one way that I can tell the difference between grevy zebras and plain zebras, grevy zebras look like they have Mickey Mouse ears. So we did get to visit the national park to see lions and elephants and some of those typical grassland animals that you would see. But we predominantly spent our time taking soil samples and looking at the vegetation. We were trying to help design a land management use policy that would help to protect the people and the animals. Something so important that I learned on this expedition was community-based conservation. If you want to conserve a species or save a species, it is so important that you have the support of the local people. And something that was just so magical about this expedition was that we had these Samburu people working with us and teaching us about the plants and their, their life. It's an experience I'll never forget. And you can see they're walking around these bright, beautiful colored cloths and beaded necklaces. And we're walking around in our, you know, funny L.L. Bean outfits. And even many times they were walking barefoot. So it just kind of puts everything in perspective. Fast forward to 2008. And by this point, from my South African elephant trip, my Kenya trip, I started traveling and participating in expeditions just about every summer. And I've been doing that for about the last 20 years now. Fast forward to 2008, I visited the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, and I got to meet one of the most remarkable women, Dr. Lori Marker. This trip was actually part of a course for my master's program. So we got to learn again about community-based conservation, what the Cheetah Conservation Fund was doing to help conserve this beautiful animal. And I got to go in and meet this animal, this cheetah, his name was Little C. I got to know what it's like to have a cheetah attack your shoelace. One thing that we did while we were at the Cheetah Conservation Fund was we helped with a water hole count. They wanted to have a census of the animals that lived in the area. So they partnered us up and then early in the morning before daylight, they dropped us off and we had to walk to our blind and we spent 12 hours in a blind recording every animal that came to this water hole. I saw a lot of warthogs and animals called guinea fowl, which are noisier than chickens. I saw some oryx. And so that was an experience to spend 12 hours in a blind. Something else that's so important to me since I'm a teacher, we got to visit the local school. And I have to say that on many of my expeditions, I love visiting schools and I love to get to meet with teachers 
from other parts of the world and we can share some common interests. When we visited this school, this is a seventh grade class. I brought some pictures that my students drew of birds of New Jersey. Because so I was thinking, well, what kind of wildlife could I bring to Namibia that would represent New Jersey? And so we did birds of New Jersey. So they did these oil pastels and I brought them to the students there. And then we talked about the wildlife that they live with and we did a project. And this was just one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. And the children sang for us and it was pretty remarkable. The teacher introduced me to the class and then she just left me alone with the class, which is something that would just not happen here in the United States. So just getting to spend time in enclosures with the cheetah, just learning about again, what the work that the Cheetah Conservation Fund does, working with local farmers, providing guard dogs for those farmers so that if a cheetah or any other kind of predator comes near their livestock, the guard dogs will chase them away. Because a lot of times the cheetahs are the ones who get blamed or they're the ones who face the retaliation. And then I'm gonna fast forward another five years to 2013. Earthwatch had set up this brand new chimpanzees of the Bodongo Forest project. And as soon as I saw that project, I didn't hesitate. I knew that I had to be part of this research project. When I was younger, and even today, Jane Goodall fascinates me. She inspires me. The work that she's done with not just chimpanzees, but just raising global awareness about even just peace and kindness is an inspiration to me. So I knew that I needed to be part of this chimpanzees of the Bodongo Forest Project. So there were three focuses of this project, the chimpanzees, of course, the forest, and also the people that live along the edge of the forest. The researchers were noticing that even though the trees were alive, they were not bearing fruit. And the fruit from these trees was one of the, is, is one of the chimpanzees' main food resources. So part of that was, let's collect data to see if we can start to figure out why that is happening. So when we first got to the Bodongo Field Station, we had to have a quarantine period to make sure that we were healthy enough because humans can transmit diseases to chimpanzees. So it was very important to make sure that we were healthy. So before we were allowed to go into the forest with the chimpanzees, we worked on collecting data of the trees. After our quarantine period was over, we were then allowed to go into the forest and collect data and make observations about the chimpanzees and also other primates that live in the forest such as a black and white colobus monkey. When I look at this picture, I still can't believe that I'm the person on the other side taking this photograph. So we got to spend full days in the forest observing the behavior and the foraging habits of the chimpanzees. I tempered my expectations when I first signed up for this expedition and I thought, okay, as in any expedition, you know that you're going to nature and wildlife can be very unpredictable. And even though it was called a chimpanzee project, I had to set some expectations that maybe I wouldn't have the sightings of chimpanzees that I would be hoping for, but the trip exceeded my expectations. If I was a tourist and I went to Uganda, I'd probably get to spend one hour with chimpanzees. We also had to make sure that we maintained a safe distance from the chimpanzees, but that only went one way. Humans needed to make sure that they kept their distance, but the chimpanzees could certainly come near you if they wanted to. And oftentimes they would come into camp. So sometimes first thing in the morning, you would hear their pant hoots, and then you would know that there might be some chimpanzees there in the camp at the field station. So as I mentioned, uh, one important part of the project was also, in addition to 
focusing on the chimpanzees, the people that lived along the edge of the forest. If the chimpanzees don't have their food, that means that there is great potential for human wildlife conflict. So sometimes chimpanzees come and raid the crops of the local farmers. So what we did was we went out to some local farmers and we had a questionnaire through translation. We got to interview the farmers to find out their experiences with the chimpanzees, when they might be raiding their crops and how they felt about it as well. There was also a vet staff at the field station and the vet staff worked with some of the local villagers to help keep their livestock healthy. So we had an opportunity to go to the village and this was another volunteer on my project and she's giving a goat some dewormer. So again, seeing the importance of getting the support of the local people, helping to support them is extremely important. So again, sometimes we had some up close encounters with chimpanzees. And one night, the rangers that we worked with asked us if we wanted to see the chimpanzees go into their nests at night. So we went into the forest and as it started to get later in the day, the chimpanzees climbed up into the trees and this male chimpanzee, you can see he's older and he's also been pretty picked on. He's fixing and adjusting the leaves in his nest. That is a moment I will never forget. When I saw that this chimpanzee project was starting up in Uganda, and I believe we were the second team, and I have a, a friend of mine who I also get to teach with, she came on this expedition with me. And I said, well, you know, the Bawindi impenetrable forest is also in Uganda. So we need to go see mountain gorillas because another hero of mine is Diane Fossey. And when I was younger, I saw the film Gorillas in the Mist and I saw the work that she did for mountain gorillas. And I just became enamored with them. So we got our permits and we got to trek to see mountain gorillas. As we were making our trek, the rangers that we were working with got a radio call and they said, oh, we have to stop for lunch. We can't proceed any further. Our gorilla group was fighting with another group of gorillas. So our gorilla group was a habituated group and they were fighting with a non-habituated group. So we had to wait for them to stop their conflict before we could continue on our trek. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be interesting to meet a group of gorillas after they've been having some type of conflict with another group. But when we got there, they were calm and they were just munching on their leaves. And we had to hack through a lot of the vegetation so that we could get some view of them. So sometimes you would just hear the crunching of the leaves. When I saw the first gorilla, I'd realized that I'd fulfilled a lifelong dream. So I just wanna conclude my presentation with, to tell anybody who wants to be an explorer or go on an expedition to just follow your passions and make sure that you surround yourself with people who support you. I know that I've been really fortunate to have a lot of support around you know, my, my journey as an explorer. And so when I look at this pair of gorillas, it, it makes me think of all the support that I've been given. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Wow, beautiful photos. So did you take all of those photos of these animals? Yes. Wow. Yes. That, that's great. If you can do me a favor here and switch, I guess we can turn off the the um, screen share and we can go into Q&A. We have some questions from the chat. Um, but one question I really am wondering, I mean, you have been in wet, cold, scary <laughs> environments, 12 hours hanging out in a water hole, attacked by rhinos, attacked <laughs> by elephants. 
how do you conquer these difficult situations and what skills do you think you, you need or what have you developed to be able to handle this, um, d- these difficult situations? That's a great question. Um, I have to say for me, part of the fear was just going to the unknown initially. Many times on these expeditions, I didn't know anybody. I was going to meet up with a group of people in country and it was always, you know, it's a brand new group of people getting together. Hopefully, you know, we're like-minded people. So there's an expectation that you're going to get along. But for me, that was part of the fear. My passion and love for animals just sort of, not that I would never, you know, put myself in a, in a situation. I always listen to the experts who are around me always. So when, you know, the elephant was charging and the person who's driving is like, get down. I stopped taking my pictures and I did exactly what they said to do. Really sounds like you found your community of people, animal lovers and explorers and it's really awesome to hear about the mentors that you've had, the female explorers who really paved the way in cheetah conservation with Lori Marker, Elephant or um, Diane Fossey and her gorillas, and Jane Goodall, of course, and chimpanzees. And it's so incredible that you were able to follow in their footsteps and continue that work. Um, so I think it's it's as we celebrate the women of the Explorers Club and you yourself are a woman of the Explorers Club, um, it's so inspiring to hear that, that you can continue this work from these leaders. Um, so what do you, how do you, inco- this is actually a question from the chat. Um, how do you incorporate what you've learned into your classes? Because you yourself as a teacher are sharing this with, with young students and young women. So how do you incorporate this into your um, teaching? So I'm fortunate that I'm now a seventh grade life science teacher. So that makes it easy. So the elephant project that I mentioned, it's about seeing if the population is growing too large. So one concept that we focus on when I'm teaching my students about ecosystems is something called carrying capacity and looking at the environment to see if there are enough resources to support. So it's a great opportunity for me to bring in that elephant project. When we focus on climate change, I did another project in the Pyrenees Mountains, helping to collect data to see what's happening to that mountainous environment. So setting small mammal traps. And so then I have an opportunity to bring that in. And then I can also talk to the kids about mark recapture. When we captured in those mammal traps, if we had small mammals, we tagged them. So I get to bring in my experience, I could teach them from the book, but I, you know, I'm so fortunate that I do have a wealth of experience that I can make connections to those different concepts. Pretty incredible, all the work that you've contributed towards this greater field of science and conservation in general, and being able to share that with your students, I'm sure is inspiring and has excited them to go out into the field. So that one was from Alan. We have another question here from Brian. Brian asks, is there an animal that you always wanted to see in the wilderness that you haven't seen yet? And you've seen a lot. (laughs) Polar bears. Polar Mm -hmm. bears and lemurs in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And I could probably give you, you know, another 20, but those are two animals that are on my next wish list. I don't want to say it like that. It sounds like I'm just trying to tick off seeing animals, but. Yeah. Well, my question is, I, when I'm looking at your photos of these, these chimpanzees and these gorillas, and you can really see how similar they are to humans, but something like the whales that you mentioned in your article on reachtheworld.org, you talk about smelling a whale's breath. <laughs> so you really felt these animals and what, how they actually behave. First of all, what does a whale's <laughs> breath smell like? <laughs> <laughs> to me, it smelled like the worst smelling fish possible. Yeah. And I guess, and then second is, how do you interact with these animal, these monkeys that are just so similar to humans? And do you think they feel that you're similar to them as well? And is that a different experience than working with something like a cheetah or working with an elephant? So 
in the Badango forest, that group of chimpanzees had been studied for a very long time. So they were very habituated. And there were rangers that we got to work with that have known those chimpanzees for decades. So, and I agree with you. I think one of the reasons I'm so drawn to gorillas and chimpanzees is because we are so similar. And when you watch the behavior and you see, when I showed you the picture of that older male chimpanzee working on his nest, we got to see that he was very picked on by the other chimpanzees. And that's a, a very human characteristic oh as well. Yeah. Wow. Or just, you know, I chose that last photo of the gorillas because to me it, it shows some compassion there. It's, you know, some friendship or taking care of each other. Yeah, it really goes to show how much we still don't know about animals and what they think and how they act. And um, because every time you go out in the field, it's a huge endeavor to collect this data. And so we have a question from Danielle, who's asking, what can middle school students do to help with conservation projects right now? And I'd love to hear more about citizen science and how people can get involved with that. So there are some great citizen science projects that students can do. Um, the Cornell Bird Lab has their bird watch program. So you can sit in your backyard and you can collect data about the birds that come to the feeder. There's a great organization called Journey North and you can help with sightings of monarch butterflies and then you can mark those on a map so we can see what's happening with the migration of monarch butterflies. So those are just some examples of, and I think um, just to make a connection to Jesse's backyard bio that uh, I mentioned to my students and I think we're going to you know, embark on that. So exploring the animals that live in your area and something that I also need to do is look into what are the needs in your local community? Yes, exactly. It's, it's really important. And you mentioned how, how community-based conservation is such a um, strong model for conservation in places like Namibia. Um, but yeah, how does it fit into our own conservation efforts here at home? And I think we've all been really interested in our own backyard biology and we've seen more of nature in this last year. And for any teachers out there or students out there, um, Maria was referring to Backyard Bio, which is a program that um, is run through Reach the World and through our partnership um, with another organization, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And you can follow along, you can sign up and get more information about this program. And you yourself can be citizen science using just your cell phone to track whatever is in your backyard because all of these little pieces of information add to a larger pool of knowledge that um, will help us conserve different kinds of species. And Maria, it's so cool that you get to travel around the world and do this um, to, to help collect our greater knowledge. Now we have another question from Danielle who is asking, and I think we're all asking this question, what other adventures are you hoping to go on? <laughs> well, my, Adventure last summer was supposed to be more of an archaeological. I was supposed to go to Egypt. And um, then this summer I was hoping to go to Greece. So we'll see. So sometimes I, I do a departure from wildlife and I love to learn about culture and archaeology as well. I also taught history for a long time. So that's great. Yeah. And how do you find these things? If I know you mentioned that your very first project was a fellowship and that took you to British Columbia. How would you recommend that students at you know, the middle school age or the high school age or the college age, where do they go to look, to begin to explore? That's great. So Earthwatch, they do have some programs for high school students. They have opportunity, they have some teams that are for that age group. So that's a good place to start. I think once you find one and then you start talking to other people and you start networking and then you start finding out about other programs and especially with the internet, it's so easy to find grant opportunities or research opportunities. And that's what I do. I just spend a lot of time 
you know, one organization then kind of leads me to another organization or talking to other people that I've met and, you know, been on a project with, and you start sitting around a campfire and you start talking about the places you've been and some of the programs that have afforded you those opportunities. And then it just kind of sets you on that path. And that's what happened for me. Wow. Yeah. Great. I know there's lots of resources online, but really building that network. And um, I, I think talking to your science teachers too, would be a good place to start because there's a lot of um, possibilities for careers in science and where that can take you um, to explore the world. Now we have another question here from Alan. Any thoughts of writing a kids or young adults book? <laughs> I've thought about it probably more from a photography point of view, you know, maybe using photos and then setting a story that way. I have, I have thought about it and there are so many photographers that inspire me from the, um, you know, league of international conservation photographers. And some of them are doing that type of work. So they do inspire me and it, it does cross my mind sometimes. <laughs> So photography is one skill that you have. It sounds like you kind of need it, especially we're looking at these amazing photos and you can learn so much from what you're capturing in a photo. You're also, you also have a background in science. What, what would you recommend are the skills or the classes that students take in order to prepare themselves to go on an expedition? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> I think, I don't know if there's a course that, that you could do, but I think having flexibility is extremely important. Being able to see other people's points of view is extremely important, especially when you're going to a community and you're doing research, but you're still a visitor there and you need to listen to their needs and their stories. So I think just some interpersonal skills would be useful. And then of course, researching, you know, what is the climate like? Making sure that you have the right equipment with you to be warm or if it's going to be hot. So those are important too. So some research, research skills would also be useful. But I think the people skills are what would take you the furthest. Can you share another story about a community that you visited that really maybe was a challenge to communicate with or where you were inspired by um, how they might do things differently or similarly to us? Uh, one of my last trips that I did, I didn't mention it, but I went to India to photograph tigers. And I specifically went just to, I went on a spring break and <laughs> I went to, so it was a short trip, but I went to Rathenborn National Park just to photograph tigers. And the, the rangers that we work, you know, I don't wanna say work with, I wasn't there to collect data. I was really there to just observe and learn. And there was a great community project for women. And they set up a co-op to print materials and then they would make these handicrafts out of it and it empowered the women to set up their own bank accounts. And so to me, it was just a very empowering project and to see how that would be so important to be on the outside of the park. So going to India and it's the second time I've been to India with a different purpose and meeting with a different group of people there. They just always inspire me. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to hear about all these different women's initiatives around the world because there is a really long history of um, women's oppression and um, the challenges that women face. And so everywhere from every to every corner of the world this month during Women's History Month, we're learning about all these really amazing initiatives to support the growth and the economic freedom of, of women. So um, that that's really cool to hear. And one final question that I have, sort of similar to what skills you need. Now you're preparing for an expedition and you're going off halfway around the world into an area where you may or may not get um, 
in, in touch with an elephant that's right, standing right in front of you. How do you prepare for something you've absolutely never done before? Because some of our students say, I don't wanna go somewhere new because I don't know what it's like over there. So what, how do you prepare for an expedition? What do you pack? How do you even think about packing? Um, you would almost think that we set up this question beforehand because I, I have just from that Wales expedition, I have my expedition briefing. I just happened to have it out because I did this expedition almost 20 years ago. So, you know, I needed to refresh my memory. And so some organizations will give you something like this. And in this expedition briefing, they tell you what the research is, what you're going to be doing in the field, what physical condition you need to be in to be able to complete that. Because they'll say you need to be able to hike six miles with a, you know, 20 pound back or 30 pound pack. So, and that also, I look at that before I sign up for something to say, okay, is this, it's always going to put me out of my comfort zone. And it's always going to challenge me, you know, that Pyrenees mountain project. I mean, I am not a mountain climber and I, def, I definitely, you know, put myself out there with that, <laughs> with that expedition. So having something like this is really helpful. But again, just reading what other researchers have done in that area, what their stories are. And again, I mean, with the internet, you can find so much about the climate and what kinds of medications you should take or immunizations you need before traveling there. So again, I just say research, research, research. Mm. I do that a lot. <laughs> I'm sure it's your hobby to figure out where to go next. So, Dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so is your next, are you going to be doing your trips? We're curious to hear if you're going to go back to um, whatever was canceled last year. Do you have any so, upcoming, upcoming expeditions we should be on the lookout for, for your photos? Not, a, it's more of a cultural journey rather than an expedition for this summer. And then I will, I've already started you know, dreaming about 2022 and, and what I might want to do. There's a lion project. So I, you know, I could easily find 20 different projects that I would love to do. Well, I'm sure we are just waiting to hear more about <laughs> the next projects. And I'm sure you have a million more stories for us. Uh, but unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. So thank you so much, Maria. Um, and thank you to our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us. Be sure to visit the Women of the Explorers Club homepage at reachtheworld.org. There you'll be able to read Maria's outstanding article. Um, you'll see more of her photos and you can scroll through and meet more inspiring female explorers who are part of the Explorers Club. And for an upcoming listing of all of Reach the World's live events, visit at home.reachtheworld.org. Thanks so much. See you next time. Thank you.